Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. Last week I did a video where I recorded a live vocal production with Amira and Akon using the Muse app, which is a remote recording solution. It worked fantastically. I got the recording in and now in this video I want to go over the post work, the editing and mixing. So let's pop on in here, let's play a little bit of, of it down and then explain what's going on. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about the process a little bit. So I took the original track and I ended up shifting it down a couple semitones in order to make it work a little bit better for Amira's range. Once that was done, I sent the vocal, just the session vocal over to Neptunes, who's the producer, and he reproduced the record, not only shifting it to the lower key, but also changing around the production to fit the vocal better. I think this is generally a good way to work, although maybe the key change part is something that you do try to avoid, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. But mostly it's the idea of creating the idea of the record, and then once the vocals are, are top-lined and maybe a demo is recorded or even official cut is recorded, you then go back to the production and sort of conform it to what the vocals are doing. Shift things around a little bit arrangement-wise in order to make sure that it's supporting the vocal at all turns, and I, I find that that ends up yielding the best results. So in terms of the sound of the production, this was coordinated with me and Neptunes. This was not like I'd got a beat and that was it. Uh, we talked about it. There's a certain sound that Neptunes has that is very, very hard to replicate. He just, he has a great feel. All of his production feels very cohesive and there's so many moving parts in the rhythm that it's really important that everything is dynamically working exactly right and sonically gelled in exactly the right way. And he puts some sauce on his mix bus and his groups and things like that that just kind of goes away when stuff gets tracked out. And it's very, very difficult to replicate the feel of it. It. The sound, easy. The feel, very challenging. So I asked him to send a two track, but without any kind of limiting on there. And as you can see, just by looking even at the waveform, there's plenty of dynamic space here for a vocal. This is not a crushed record. So plenty of space going on. Now, when I hear it with the vocals, I felt like I still wanted just a little bit more edge on the attack of everything. And I'll play it again real quick. You'll hear what I mean. <laughs> On I'm crazy, I make us a baby. I'm a freak in the sheets, but in the streets, I'm a lady. Do the 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 track isn't bad in terms of like the sonics of it, but that kick is like overly round. You only really notice it when the vocal is in and the snare could even lift a little bit more. So here I'm adding some punch to the low end and some upper mid punch, like some snap to the snare. And what's going to happen is the kick is going to become a little bit more prominent and the snare is going to float up into the tweeter a little bit. That ending rhythm, that da da da, needs to be really prominent because that's the rhythmic motif that really hits. And then on top of that, it creates this effect where you have this really nice supported low end, so your bass, your sub, all that kind of stuff. And then your vocal occupies the low mid here, and then the snare lives actually a little bit above that. And then the all the 
fun floaty percussion stuff is even higher than that. So it creates a really, really tall sound. And really, that was the only major piece of the puzzle. The only thing else that I've got going on here is time adjuster. Because it was a different beat, the pocket was ever so slightly different, and I had to play with it in very, very tiny intervals in order to get the feel just, just right. And I ended up ever so slightly laying the beat back, but like by a hair, like really by not much at all. Uh, going down from there, we get into the vocal editing. So there's a few things going on. The first is that I'm using revoice in conjunction with autotune, or repitch rather, uh, synchro arts repitch in conjunction with autotune. And I want to explain that real quick. Autotune here is not the pitch corrector. Auto-tune here is for tone. It's part of the vocal sound. It's almost like a reverb or a flanger or a chorus or a compressor rather than a pitch control. Repitch is the pitch control. So what I'm doing is I have auto-tune on, getting the amount of that auto-tune sound that I want, and then I'm using repitch to control every moment. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that here. If I scroll down to my background vocals and I solo this one up, I'm going to turn on, I'm going to, I'm silly, I'm going to keep it off for a second. I'm just going to turn this up real quick. I'm done waiting, no more playing, he keeps saying. So you notice that the auto-tune, while it's getting a lot of that tone that we like, it's kind of making her voice sound a little bit like a kazoo, and it's really glitchy on this middle line right here. I'm done waiting, no more playing. He keeps saying. So now I'm going to pull up repitch and let's go on over here and see what's going on. So with repitch, I'm moving things more in place so that the auto tune is not working quite as hard. It's working harder to a more centered pitch. And then I'm also making sure that any of that glitchy stuff that might be happening where it's like the tone is getting pulled to different notes really fast is smoothed out, ironed out, and we get a better sound overall. So I'm going to unbypass this. I'm done waiting. No more playing. He keeps saying. And it sounds smoother. It's not the biggest change in the world, but think about all of the stacks, the leads, all of the vocals now getting that same treatment where everything's being smoothed out a little bit. It ends up feeling like the auto-tune and the vocal performance are completely one-to-one -one in sync with each other and really agreeing. So that ends up sounding like this. No, I'm done waiting. No more playing. He keeps saying. I love on him crazy. I make okay, so continuing with the editing, there's a lot of micro editing going on here, right? There's a very, very specific pocket that we're trying to hit with this vocal. I love on him crazy. I make us a baby. I'm a freaking machine. I love on him crazy, might make us a baby, he a freak in the sheep. So that downbeat especially needs to have that same pocket, that same exact kind of like kick vocal kind of thing. It's almost like a flam, kick vocal. And we want to keep that consistent and outline that rhythm throughout. That then switches halfway through the verse. Now we want it every day, every really cool switch and it kind of shows just how good and how experienced of a writer Khan is. Uh, he did the top lining for this. So it switches from the drum pushing the vocal to the vocal pushing the drum because the where the pocket hits done it every day what a night cap so now it's going cap downbeat like word downbeat right so it's that same flam but it's in the opposite direction so now the vocal is pushing the beat at the second half the back half of the verse which i think is really really cool and i think you know that will strongly contribute to the success of this song now what i'm doing here is i'm really micromanaging every moment so like let's say let's take the word day here now we want it every day every I want the word day to hit exactly the same way that cap is hitting over here. So if we were to say, take like, 
just like a little um, grid line here, you can see that we've got this kind of space to the emphasis here. We've got a little less space to the emphasis here. So doing stuff like taking this and sliding this back a couple nudges and now playing it, I think will improve the sound. I just noticed that now, actually. I didn't do it in the original pass because there's so many of these, like, micro moments that can be managed. But I'll probably keep it, actually, and reprint it because I caught it in this very second. But there's a lot of that stuff going on. And I'll show you a really, really cool example of that kind of micro-editing stuff. So I'm going to switch this back to the original here for a brief moment. Yeah, sure, this is fine. Uh, and I'm going to play through this, and I want you to listen to the word ride at the very end. He gon' treat me like a queen, gon' protect me and provide, cause he know that I'm gon' ride, and he love the way I ride. You touch him. It's not bad, but listen to how short the word ride feels. He gon' treat me like a queen, gon' protect me and provide, cause he know that I'm gon' ride, and he love the way I ride. Now, I'm gonna switch it back to the edit, Listen to the word ride now. Really, really listen. He gon' treat me like a queen, gon' protect me and provide, cause he know that I'm gon' ride, and he love the way I ride. You I stretched the word just a little bit so it felt like it was in pocket the same way provide is in pocket and all of those other ends of those phrases are. And it's that kind of stuff where because I was in control of the tracking session and I was able to get the takes I wanted to get, uh, get the all the edits during the comping, uh, you know, doing all the clip gain and basic nudges and everything like that, and had that control, that allowed me to then use my editing time. Instead of having to do all of those things, I could instead focus on the really, really nuancey stuff. Now, none of these little nuancey changes are going to make or break the record, but 20 of these nuancy changes actually could. So that's what it's providing me and allowing me to do. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also using Vocaline on the background vocals. So those stacks, everything is really, really synced up tightly for the most part. Uh, there's a couple things that I left a little loose. Akon's background stacks, I let them be a little loose because I thought that it was really nice, but all of Amira's stuff here is locked in pretty tightly. So uh, this, the default setting I use for that is Vocaline with a 40 millisecond um, flexibility in terms of the time. That, to me, keeps it from sounding overly tight, in which case it can make the background vocals feel a little small. It allows just for enough pocket where you get a sense of, like, space between everything, but it all feels like it's still in time. At least that's what I found. Sometimes doing tighter is good if you want to really stack something up and make it feel like just like one really full vocal. That can be a very cool effect as well, but I kind of like the more like gang style vocal of like a bunch of people singing together, but just like with a really good pocket. Uh, let's get into the treatment for the vocal. So the treatment for the vocal here is pretty unique in some respects, but actually not all that unique for the way that I approach vocals that I've tracked. So the vocal is more about the effect of the vocal rather than the sound of the vocal, and I want to orient myself toward that as much as possible when I'm producing. Uh, basically, all of the level stuff is being handled with either these like little clip gain things, uh, there's some clip gain on the original track where I printed from repitch, but then there's also these like little plus 2 dB things like right in this clip here to make everything feel like it's basically in the same realm or where I, it wants to be. I don't necessarily go by the shape of the waveform though, because if you match everything by the shape of the waveform, it's going to sound like it's out of proportion, probably because of how human hearing works and reacts to different frequencies and things like that. On top of that clip gain work, there's also volume rides where things shift as much as like maybe 2 dB, but most of them are like half dB to 1 dB kind of shifts. Uh, and that's on every vocal track. There's these kinds of rides going on here. Now, there's no compression, like generic style of compression on the vocals, except for on this post-chorus here, which I'll, I'll 
get to momentarily because there's some other effects going on as well. Instead, I have multiband compression and I'm doing it for a very, very distinct specific effect. So in the C6, the Wave C6, there is a preset called, uh, it's under old school, where is it? It's uh, old school C4 pop vocal and it's a sound that I guarantee you've heard a million times. So many people use this exact preset. Now my variation on it here is almost identical but check out the attack times across the board here. Uh, this is the original exactly how it comes in. Now watch this attack specifically. Notice that the attack has slowed down and if you look across the board the attack is basically twice as slow as it is in the original. So it's giving me the original character, but just a little bit more punch and then ever so slightly less top end. It's normally 7 dB on the top. This for me is uh, 5.7. So it's a little adjusted. So it's a very slight variation on this sound, but it's a really, really cool sound. I'll, uh, I'll open it up here and play it for you real quick. I love on I'm crazy. I make us a baby. I'm a freaking the sheets. I love on them crazy. I make us a baby. I'm a freaking the sheets. So it's not, it's not as dramatic as you would think if you were to like look at what it's doing. Doing like I'm supposed. I got his heart, got his soul. He got me all. Doing like I'm supposed. I got his heart, got his soul. He got me all in the mo. It just puts like this really interesting sense of like urgency and stress to the vocal that sounds nice. I don't know. I know it sounds weird to say that the stress sounds nice, but like I don't know how else exactly to describe it. So that's really doing the work of what a typical compressor would do. I experimented with Vocal Rider. I only ended up keeping it on a couple of tracks here. You can see on this main track, it's inactive. Uh, and then on a lot of these backing tracks, it's inactive as well. Well, it's bypassed. And then on some of the tracks, I ended up keeping it. And that was really just a feel thing. Like, it, it felt like it worked there, so I kept it where it felt like it worked, and I did not keep it where it didn't work. Um, it's actually, it's in a few places. It's on this lead. It's on the chorus lead as well. So there's vocal rider going on. But again, that's sort of an automated vocal autom like volume automation thing so it's not exactly a compressor but it kind of does what a compressor does the only place we really see like a compressor compressor here is on this post chorus oh yeah he love my kids it needed it basically it just felt like it needed a little squeeze uh, there's a couple other things going on there too i also have kaleidoscopes which is kind of a fun imaging sort of like it can do a few things it can be like a stereo flanger imager kind of thing oh yeah he love my hips and thighs and no way i ride uh huh Oh yeah, he love my hips and thighs and no way I ride uh huh he wanna so it just, it kind of makes it subtle still. Uh, I felt like that kind of worked in that area because I wanted it to be as like slinky and almost sleepy sounding because it's supposed to be very like nighttimey, full moon kind of sexy song. I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I use weird ways of thinking about things in order to get what I want. Um, once we get down to the vocal bus, this is where the real work is happening. All of this is kind of like basic pre-treatment here. Like there's, uh, you know, there's a little, what, half dB bump at around 460 to add a little body here. But like really there's not a lot going on here. This is all kind of setting up the effect of the vocal. So it's more like the style of the vocal. And then when I get to the bus, that's where the actual treatment of the vocal starts showing up. And the big move here is on Amber. This is uh, an Avalon 2055 EQ, I believe, that it's emulating, and I'm taking out 5 dB at 1.6K. The reason for that is because Amira is tracking on a Neumann U87. Now, I like the U87. Some people really don't like it. Some people love it. 
I'm in the middle. I like it. I think that it's a useful mic in certain circumstances. It's good when somebody has a darker or more repressed voice, a softer voice. It will pull those front of face tones that happen between about one, so around that 1.6 to like 2K range. It'll pull that stuff forward. However, most vocalists will tend to push energy through their front of face. That's where a lot of the personality and tone of the vocalist comes from, makes them unique. And when you're talking specifically about a mirror, an Akon, they have very bold front of face vocals. A U87 is not a good microphone for them. I would much rather be using something like this microphone, which is uh, Circle Audio 251. 251 style microphones are way more flattering to the majority of vocalists because most vocalists who have good delivery tend to have a lot of front of face energy that's part of what makes the delivery good so it, usually a 251 style microphone is preferable unless the vocalist has something like a very kind of sleepy sunk back kind of voice that's more like this i don't know i have a really front of face tone i sound horrible on a u87 worse than anybody on the planet probably uh, but yeah, so I'm cutting down 5 dB at 1.6K, and that's a pretty big move. And then uh, some typical DSing here, that's nothing really special to that, that's pretty customary. And then here I'm just controlling the low end, controlling the mid band, so that anywhere where things start to get a little bit too husky, everything is kind of just kept in the pocket a little bit. So you see, it's not really working all that often. It's just, it's saving me from having to go through and like, like literally automate an EQ, which I'm actually already doing in some places. I've got, uh, right in the first verse, I have automation on the EQ here. Uh, I've got this master bypass clicking off and on because there's certain parts where her front of face tone, she's a little bright. So I'm taking out some 3K, but you'll notice that it's only happening in on very specific words. I love on them crazy. I make us a baby. I'm a freaking machine. If you watched the last video, I mentioned that on a, E, and I vowels, you don't have to push so much. This is an example of how those tones are carrying even without a terrible amount of push. Amira has this... She, she comes from a hip-hop background where, like, screaming into a microphone is just the go-to because of, like, the way the live performances play out and everything like that, the energy, all that kind of stuff. And so she's working against that kind of, like, subconscious training she's still pushing a little bit on her A, E, and I vowels. And so when she's really leaning into the cadences, that becomes exaggerated. And so this is controlling that. And it's better just to do it with manual bypassing of an EQ than to try and put some kind of crazy multiband on the entire vocal, where in most places it's not needed. It's just a few spots where she gets overly brassy because of the, the context of those vowels and the fact that it's the cadence of the line. So, okay. Back to this, a uh, little more EQ, look, here we go, around the 2K range again, this is that U87 again. So, a lot of carving out, but you know, at the end of the day, the U87 is a good mic, so while it did require quite a bit of EQ in order to get it where it needed to be, the end result sounds good. So, it took to the EQ really well, which is nice. We got there. Uh, now, there's a few different effect sends going on here. Let's talk about our general reverb. Our general reverb here, originally in the tracking session, I had the Valhalla Vintage Verb up. When we got to the mix, I wanted something that was maybe a little bit more romantic sounding, and for that, I typically use either my Bercassi M7, or most typically, I actually have my own presets in the Relab LX480L called Romantic Plate, and that tends to work really well. In this particular case, I preferred the Bercassi, so our main reverb that we're hearing is this. Really nice sounding, and then a little bit of EQ on there because, hey, look, that 2K range is propagating a little bit too much. So, yeah, reoccurring theme there. And then it's, you know, it's a lot lower than I just played it back. The other thing I've got going on here is the quarter note. This is also a Valhalla plugin that was on there. It was uh, their, their delay 
Um, I don't have their delay in my home studio. Khan has it on his laptop. So I just committed it on his laptop before sending it to myself. And uh, here it is printed out. Beat it up and I go slow. How we want it every day, every night and night catch. And it actually has a really, really nice flavor to it. It's got this like kind of cool, smooth lo-fi thing going on, like ever so slight bit of like coloration that almost feels flangy, but like not in the way of it being like a flanger, that kind of a thing. So it's it's got a nice little tone to it. And then of course I'm sending it to my reverb as well so that the reverb is on the delay, a uh, very common technique. And we get a nice ambience that couples together. Subtle, but it works. Um, and then there's one more throw here. So it's this weight throw. And if you remember the session, Khan mentioned uh, do a low octave of Amira's voice and blend it in and see how that sounds. I'm a little 50-50 on how it ended up sounding because I'll, I'll show you why. So first I tried it with Little Alter Boy. I didn't like it. Then I tried it with Sound Shifter Pitch and it sounded way better. Uh, I'll play the two real quick. Here's with Little Alter Boy. Here it is with Sound Shifter. It sounds a lot more like a low octave voice. It doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like it's doing something weird in terms of the phasing and filtery kind of quality that I'm getting from Little Alter Boy. That said, a lot of the times I really like Little Alter Boy, so this is not a diss to Sound Toys here. I love that plugin. It just so happens that this worked better this time. Uh, and then a little bit of EQ taking out some of the sub stuff that started showing up and pushing it more into the low mid body. Now, I do have to say, part of me actually likes it with just the vocal being louder. It's a tough call. It's it sounds a little bit more blended. I can get the same kind of like solidity of the vocal with that low octave in there, adding weight to it. It's a really nice technique to thicken up a sound. That said, I'm very tempted to just take this trim off, bypass the pitch plugin, uh, maybe like move this up a hair, and then use this just as a send with the same extra little bit of parallel EQ happening, basically. So what I would like you guys to do is in the comment section below, tell me which one you like better. Do you like it better where it's just a little bit more volume on the vocal? Or do you prefer it where I have the sound shifter in parallel, which one more time sounds like this. It does kind of allow the rhythm elements to stand out a little bit more when I have the vocal pushed back a little bit and I have that low octave that's firming it up. Um, yeah, I don't think it's an easy call. I'm curious to see what you guys say in the comments section. Uh, Going from there, the backgrounds are really easy. Everything is, well, uh, all of the mirrors are vocal aligned so that they kind of stack up really nicely. Khan, I didn't feel like he even really needed vocal line. Everything just pocketed really well. So, uh, yeah, nothing crazy there. Typically, when I use vocal line, I use like the 40 millisecond kind of spacing so that everything kind of fluctuates within 40 milliseconds of each other. That's like just enough space to be audibly recognized as being out of sync. Anything less than that gets into what's called the host zone where you don't really hear time the same way. So if you're doing like the standard typical 20 millisecond vocal line, that can be a really, really cool effect. But the effect ends up becoming just like one very thick sounding vocal, which again can be great. But here I wanted it to 
specifically sound like multiple vocalists creating a kind of gang vocal type of sound. Um, in terms of the processing, it's a lot of the same stuff. The only thing that's different is I'm using a different sense of space here. I've got the east-west spaces on Khan's vocal, adding a little bit of reverb, and then all of the uh, backgrounds that Amir is doing is getting the hall reverb, which is the original Valhalla vintage verb here. So that still has made its way onto the record. And the reason I'm using the hall is because those background vocals are creating a sense of deeper space. So the, the lead vocal is very forward and the reverb is being used for color and the background vocals are in the background and providing space. And that, that hall reverb, because of its slower echo density buildup, creates a sense of depth. So different reverbs for different purposes there. It's kind of a cool technique. I definitely recommend trying it sometime, you know, tight plate on your lead, uh, wider or deeper hall sound on your background vocals. Uh, cool. So with all of that done, that brings us to the mix bus. There's a lot of stuff going on on the mix bus. Uh, I am not team leave it for the mastering engineer. I think that that is silly. So yeah, lots of effects on the mix bus. The first is Spectre that's giving it this this plugin a little goes a long way. So it's giving it just a little bit of saturation on the mids just to kind of make everything feel a little thicker. So just a little body there. And then we've got Amber again. This time we're getting a little bit of pop in the top right here. So 3 dB of top end and a little bit of forwardness right around the 1K range, 900 Hertz, just to kind of pull the vocal forward a little bit. And this is kind of like... This compression is being used for groove, but it's also being used to kind of like bring everything forward a little. So it's kind of like pre-volume in a way, pre-louder playback, a little bit of filtering on the side chain. So it allows a little bit more of the kick through. And then I'm using the 0.3 to one release. I find that that sometimes sounds a little bit more natural and breathes a little better than the 0.1 release. The typical uh, hip hop setting is like the 30 millisecond attack, the 0.1 release and the two to one ratio here. It's that, but it's the 0.3 release. And that's just going to let it breathe a little better. Now, here's another one where I want to hear what you say in the comments section below. This is a Analog Obsession plugin, and I was just playing around with it to see what I could get. It does something very interesting. It it saturates pretty heavily, and also with a little bit of this mid boost, it moves everything really forward, which is, it feels good and bad. So I'm, I'm going to play it. You want to cut, hang the police, but he had to cut. Even when he mad, he don't leave. He gon' stick with me no matter what We got money, we got cash and clothes Most important thing we got is trust Get at me or him cause it's us This the real love, it ain't lust Kind of one more time and you'll hear everything just move forward in a really kind of like cool way but at the same time it also makes things a little bit rough so it takes away some of the smoothness here's without i make him wanna cut hate the police but he had to cuff even when he mad he don't leave he gon' stick with me no matter what here's with oopsies Now, personally, I lean toward liking it. It does make the whole record a little bit bigger, but I do like the tightness of the record without it. So I'm interested to see what you uh, say in the comment section again. Do you like it with or without this Analog Obsession A-Tone plugin? And then the very, very last thing is Master Plan. It's not just going to add level, but it's also going to change the tone a little bit. So I'll give you the before and after on that as well. 
I make him wanna cut Hey, the police, but he had to cuff Even when he mad, he don't leave He gon' stick with me no matter what So I'm hitting this limiter pretty darn hard. It's holding up, although we can definitely hear a little smushing happening on the kick specifically. Uh, but that said, I'm doing a couple things with this thick control and this tape control in order to make it uh, kind of like create the illusion of the low end not getting smushed out, unless you're very, very specifically listening to the transient definition. The presence of the low end stays in the right place. This is a very loud print. You can you can see the Luffs was getting up into like that minus eight range, like minus 8.2, minus 8.5. That's pretty darn loud. Uh, I don't want to play it back without the unity on because it's, it's going to be really loud. It's going to blow out the speakers if you're listening at a good level. Uh, but... It goes to show that if you are careful about how you set things and where where you're coming in at, you'll notice I'm pulling down the input a little bit so that there's a little bit less of the clipping effect going on. Uh, if you're really careful and thoughtful about this stuff, you don't really lose much when you're going for level. And when I'm going for level, I'm usually aiming for somewhere where like maybe I lose a little, little bit off of the transients, but not so much where I feel like it's going to throw off either the groove of the record or the listener's experience. That's really what I care about the most. So one more time before and after on this. I make him wanna cut, hey the police, but he had to cuff. Even when he mad, he don't leave. He gon' stick with me no matter what. We got money, we got cash and clothes. Most important thing we gotta trust. Get me on him, cuz it's us. It also has a nice effect of kind of bringing the instrumentation forward a little bit, which I actually like. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the intended effect as I was putting it on there, but it ended up being an effect that I liked. And that's just from the compression kind of pushing the drums down a little bit and pushing everything else up. So that's the edit and the mix for this record. And then uh, the next question is mastering. Uh, oh, there is one other thing. I used VSX here to check for translation of listening in the club and the car. We're actually still in the car here, but uh, when I'm getting toward the end of a mix, I like to make my last little adjustments by checking the various playback scenarios here in VSX as like a translation tool. Uh, it saves me from having to do the car test, and I found that I was able to shape everything exactly where I wanted with very little adjustment. Uh, my mix off of my speakers came in almost identical to how I wanted it to sound in the club and the car uh, with a little tiny bit of tweaking in the um, mids, which I think is actually where I got the idea for this Spectre effect. So yeah, that covers the mix. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe with the bell notification so you get notified. If you want to get in depth into vocal production, recording technique, editing, and of course mixing, go over to weissadvice.com. It is the best site online for learning. Why? Because it's not just a bunch of tutorials. There are a bunch of tutorials, really hours of tutorials, any reference for anything that you could need in terms of using compression, EQ, reverb, you name it, we got it. But you also get access to a Discord and weekly webinars where there is in-person interactive learning. You get track outs, we go over specific lessons, we go over works in real time, I discuss my thought process. And so it's this experience, except for it's interactive, and that's happening every single week. Anyway, lastly, you know what we say here at Weiss Advice, we are musicians, sound is our instrument, and I will catch you next time.